Hi, everybody. Welcome to the December episode of the Flow Pro Show. I'm Sandy, coming to you today from Naples, Florida. And I'm Daniel. I'm coming from you for you uh, from Utrecht, in the center of Utrecht, in a beautiful tower with a beautiful view. So if I'm looking that way, then uh, I'm probably uh, looking outside uh, over the beautiful city. Nice. And so we have a special show today. We're doing our sort of top 10 countdown of 2019. But uh, before we start, I just wanted to introduce our guest um, because we'll be asking him to chip in comments as we go through our top 10. Um, and that is Paul Colmsey coming to you from Perth, Australia. So if you want to say hi, Paul. Hey everybody, um, unlike Daniel, who's in a nice meeting room with a nice view, I'm in a very hot study with a fan blowing <laughs> on me, so apologies if you hear noise, and I've le legitimately opened the door outside here. So this is just Australia outside, so if a moth or a bat like flies in and eats me, you will <laughs> understand. So that's going to stay open for the duration of the session. Okay. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so we pr really appreciate you staying up late to join us. And um, yeah, uh, Paul is a well-known, I would have to say, uh, author and business strategist, um, management consultant, what all, all other things you do, power apps, uh, extraordinaire, <laughs> that sort of thing. So, um, but, but also involved with general power platforms. So that's why he's here. All right. And if you didn't already from our tweet, we've got a um, poll, a community poll going on for our top 2019 Power Automate news. So these meaning, so where you can vote for the top, your top five. So not necessarily your favorite five, but whatever you think is, has been important in 2019. And then uh, we'll show the results of that community poll at the end. We've already picked ours, but, uh, I thought it might be cool to see what you guys think. <laughs> how that yeah, compares. let's see if it's uh, the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I can tell you so far it's not. Because <laughs> I, I took a sneak peek at the results from the last hour or so. <laughs> so. Uh, okay. Oh, well. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So we ready? Yeah. To go? Yep. Okay. Well, we're going to start with 10 and count down or count up, whichever way that goes. All right. <laughs> so I guess we could take turns talking about these, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think this well, one is added to the list just because it shows the reach of the flow community that there were so many viewers of the online flow conference it was mm -hmm. pretty awesome i think there were what 16 sessions i think it was an eight hour or nine hours so, yeah. yeah and uh and we were part of it uh, that was one of our shows was during the midday on that and um so kudos to john and gabriel for putting that together and um, and also to just to everybody else for uh, for tuning in and viewing and making that such a big event. And you can view it all on uh, John's YouTube channel. Every the whole uh, thing is on there live, and it's broken. He's got it broken down by times and what sessions are what, in case you missed it. Okay, yeah, number nine. <laughs> number nine. All those fancy animations. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, number nine, the AI builder. <laughs> yeah, it took a while for me to get through, so <laughs> sorry. Um, the AI builder is a big thing that got uh, introduced in uh, at the MBAS uh, Business Application Summit. And uh, it's really a, a big thing for uh, the whole power platform. And um, there's even more um, models coming right now, I think. Uh, there are already four. And now there are four more coming uh, in the upcoming, uh, upcoming months, I think. Mm. And um, yeah, I think we're going to see all the different uh, Azure Cognitive Services uh, coming into AI Builder. And it really makes it easier for people to use AI and build AI uh, models. Um, it's not cheap, 
<laughs> that's also a thing. <laughs> But of course, that's because it's uh, that easy to use and um, uh, it doesn't require a developer. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, on that side, it's a lot better to use. So that's really cool. Yeah, I think for all those sorts of things, it's really, it com really comes down to sort of a, um, a value analysis, like what's it worth to you to mm -hmm. have that abstraction that allows you to be able to do it instead of hiring somebody, a developer to do it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, as I said, Paul, anytime you want to jump in, feel free to. Uh, absolutely. On any of these. Okay, number eight. Uh, this might not be obvious from the screenshot, but it's supposed to be showing uh, <laughs> guest access for approvals because Daniel is a guest in my tenant. So I could yeah. have him. Uh, do an approval for me. Um, hmm. Maybe I should have had Tim approve the top ten list. <laughs> I should have. I should have added that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, I probably haven't used this because I haven't asked Daniel for any approvals. But um, uh, have you, Daniel? Yeah, I have uh, used this for approvals, and it's also possible to uh, to work together on on flows. So mm. it's more than right. just approvals. Right. And um, yeah, I hear a lot of mixed signals from the, from the companies because some really don't want people to uh, work on flows on their tenant. Uh, mm. And the ease of uh, sharing a flow with somebody from uh, outside your tenant is kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's really easy to do that. <laughs> mm. And some uh, companies are really afraid of that as well. So mm -hmm. maybe uh, Paul would know something about that, but uh, it's uh, it's certainly interesting for uh, for approval scenarios because uh, a lot of people have been ask, uh, asking for uh, um, guest approvers. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's a big thing. But uh, the sharing of uh, flows, I don't know how um, lots of enterprise uh, companies will uh, will respond to that, but uh, mm. most of them probably don't even know that it's possible. <laughs> Mm. It's possible to sort of lock that down or no? I think it's yes. when you're in, you're in. So that's the, the big thing. It's mm. I, I believe it'll all be controlled through Active Directory and mm. conditional policies and mm. things of that nature. Um, my comment to this one is actually not so much the guest access, but I'm hoping my top 10 for next year will be um, they'll fix up some of the issues with markup because, uh, 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 sorry, markdown, I should say, um, because some of the formatting yeah, is, is still a bit iffy depending on which email client you use or mm -hmm. whether you're doing yeah. it in the Flow app. So that's been a bit of a frustration for us. So I'm looking forward to them getting that sorted because there's yeah. having to work around that quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll put that on our list for next year. I <laughs> <laughs> hope it happens. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay. Number seven. Do you want to do this one? Yeah, I'm still waiting. Oh, trigger conditions. Oh. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's really uh, it's slow, uh, <laughs> slow mm. moving on. Uh -uh. Uh, but yeah, trigger conditions is a really big one. Um, because uh, at first, of course, we had the, um, uh, the way of um, having 2,000 uh, flow runs uh, a mm -hmm. month per user. Um, mm -hmm. And this is actually a way to get it um, get it a lot lower uh, because it doesn't do any checks and stuff like that or it, mm -hmm. it does the check beforehand it before it wrong. triggers mm -hmm. um, yeah so that's uh, that's easy but it also makes it possible to uh, to only run the um, run the different uh, um, flows only when uh, some some field is equal to null in this uh, in this case and that's uh, mm -hmm. that's really powerful to do that um, I I hope they will change uh, to make it easier to actually do the expressions because currently right. um, what I always do and a lot of people in the community do is create a compose for instance yep. and then run the uh, or try to create the expression and then copy right. it to the trigger condition. It would be really yep. nice to have that uh, in the trigger condition builder already. Yes. So yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I, I know I've seen a lot of mm -hmm. questions about that in the community because you just get a blank box and people don't know what to do with that. 
I think there's a there's a yeah. precedent there in in Canvas apps now with the new expression editor where you can hover over certain parts of the expression and see what's going on, mm -hmm. um, which saves a whole bunch of time. And the equivalent in in there was you know dropping on a label and putting some code mm -hmm. in to see if it works. So mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe mm -hmm. maybe the flow team could take a look at that as a precedent, and uh, it, it'd be great that to be able to be half awesome. complete an expression hover over it and see the evaluation of that expression, you know, kind of in semi real time to help you debug. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. Because I, I, I really like that feature in Power Apps. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. There's another one to add to the. Uh, <laughs> yeah. To do this we'll Microsoft. end up with more for 2020 um, uh, tonight <laughs> than. Um... <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. Number six. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, it is the ability to rename actions um, uh, that have dependencies. So uh, where you didn't used to be able to do that. Um, and so now even if you've got other things using that downstream in your flow, you can rename an action. You still have to do a little bit of finagling if it's used mm, like yeah, in I don't know if I found in expressions, yeah, but not seems like not always. I mean, sometimes that seems to work too. I think, but but anyway, um, as I said to Daniel, though, maybe maybe I just need to be more careful about how I name things to begin with. But um, but I really like the ability to mm. rename actions. This actually took yeah, um, too. like. On, on the on the flip side of this, ironically, I used to tease John Liu about this because every time we'd have a, you know, if you tease me about, oh, well, Power Apps can't do this, and I say, well, at least I can rename my uh, controls. <laughs> um, controls. So yeah, yeah I, I've lost that. Um, I've lost that ability to hit him with the uh, <laughs> uh, with that one. So kudos to the Flow team for taking away my one bit of ammo against John Liu. <laughs> well, now you've got the uh, the oh, one about please. the uh, expressions. Yeah. yeah, I'll use that now. Okay. <laughs> Number five. Oh, I was waiting five. for this one. <laughs> it's relatively low <laughs> in the top ten, but uh, yeah, there's but lots of impactful. talk about that. Uh, it's really impactful. Yeah, a lot of people have been talking about it. Uh, the different uh, new licensing options um, with the per user and the per flow plan um, or per process plan it was called first i think mm -hmm. um but um yeah it it has changed uh, a lot and um i'm actually uh, curious how of, of how this will work out with all the enterprise customers of course they can have their enterprise agreements and different kind of uh, uh pricing mm -hmm. but still um i'm i'm curious if a lot of companies uh, will get scared of this licensing or if they will buy in on this licensing, because of course the um, yeah, the Power Apps and Flow team they have, or sorry, the Power Apps and Power Automate team, I'm gonna have that mistake so many times, but <laughs> I'm still not used to it. But um, they said it was simpler for everybody, and I'm actually um, curious if uh, mm. if companies also think it's simpler for them, uh, mm -hmm. because lots of people um, I've talked to are aren't really um, um, thinking it's simpler. I think it's mm -hmm. actually uh, um, more, um, yeah, more or less easy than uh, than before. So um, it's, it's interesting to see what happens. Yeah, it sort of seems like conceptually it sounds like it could be simpler, but then when you get into mm -hmm. the nitty gritty of this case and that case and what if that mm -hmm. and what if this, yeah. that's where uh, it's I just one I don't of those. Know if, um, yeah. It's one of those scenarios that I'm sure looked great on a whiteboard at the time, right, but when you exactly. when you then stress mm -hmm. test it against, what about this and here's this scenario, and I've had these conversations just like you two would have, um, and I think the evidence is that at the moment there's still a fair degree of confusion, and uh, yeah, it does take a while to get your head around various things, and then uh, there are various enterprises that actually have grandfathered in the previous regime, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I also have clients mm -hmm. where I'm still in the world of f1 and p1 and p2s and, and things like that so you imagine i'm, I'm mm -hmm. having double double the fun <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right number what are we on four uh well actually do you want to take this one too daniel since that's your screenshot <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so a lot of people have been uh, waiting for this feature for a long time. And we all saw the crazy John Liu flows where <laughs> there's uh, 20,000 uh, <laughs> actions in uh, one flow. No, that's not possible, but a lot of actions <laughs> in one flow. Um, <laughs> And I think also John would love to uh, to to see a lot of lot more child flows in there with mm. modules and stuff like that. Uh, but this action has been dropped. Uh, the run a child flow action, and that makes it possible to have like a, a, a master and child flow uh, available there. Um, so you can actually create modules of actions and then um, trigger them from uh, a bigger flow. So that's um, yeah, that's one of the things that a lot of people have been waiting for, and it's finally here. So that's a good thing. Um, it's still only possible for solution aware flows. That's also a big one. Um, so you need to have um, the flow running inside a solution. Um, but that's uh, when you know that it's uh, it's uh, really easy to use. Mm. Yeah, the, the biggest uh, impact of that one at the moment is pretty much Power Apps developers that like to trigger flows. You can't use a Power Apps trigger in a solution just yet. So for me, that one is still in the in the case of um, uh, beta, just because of that one key workload uh, that us that us Canvas app folks uh, uh, tend to use. So I'm looking forward to them resolving that problem so that I can start utilizing yeah. that one a lot. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Number three is UI flows. So uh, this we haven't talked about on the show at all before because that came out at Ignite and um, we missed our November show, I guess, because of the holidays and Ignite and everything. Well, holidays in the US, that is. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, so UI flows, that's a new, new type of flow um, that lets you um, basically create automate something that maybe doesn't have an API so there's the web web ones and the um, what are they calling the other ones desktop, desktop ones? ones yeah, yeah. Um, so basically where you, where you record what's going on in it and uh, and then you can um, automate that so I gather from what I see people talking about that um, it's not completely ready for prime time yet or have you used it in an actual scenario yet daniel no i i have tried I it out it's all mm -hmm. uh, proof of concept phase right now mm -hmm. um because it's uh, it's still in preview and i won't mm -hmm. advise anybody to use preview features uh, mm -hmm. um and that's that's for a reason of course but still, you can try it out already and uh, wait for the general availability to come and then um, go full speed ahead with it. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think it's really powerful um, to use these kinds of flows uh, for mm -hmm. legacy applications mm -hmm. and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. And I see tons of other uh, companies also um, using RPA tool, uh, tools to, um, yeah, to, to automate stuff. Uh, I still think there's also danger in this because I think um, you should always aim as a company to uh, make sure that there's no no, no legacy at all. Um, mm. But uh, that's hard, of course. And if you use a UI flow for legacy tooling, it, it kind of tends to go the wrong way because then there's no real need to replace it. Maybe. Right, right. Um, so that's kind of my struggle with it because... I think RPA, it's, it's, it's nice that you can do uh, automation there, um, but um, we should always aim to, um, to replace it with something else that's more, uh, more in the future, right? <laughs> that, that's a good point. That's a really good point, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Number two. Uh, oh, copy paste. Yeah. So being able to use a clipboard in flow, I do use this one a lot. Um, so it's just really handy to be able to copy paste or yeah, copy actions, maybe, you know, one that you've done a lot of work on the, um, all of the fields or whole scopes, uh, you know, if you need to repeat, um, 
a, a whole scope of something within a flow that's really handy for that. And, um, and I like how you can, I think it was, was it Sunai who showed us that? He yeah. demoed it and uh, on one of the shows and um, I used his trick a fair bit where he was showing how you can um, just control C, control V that and then uh, basically save it, save the JSON to notepad or something and then uh, mm -hmm. have put that back in your clipboard even after you've, um, you know, when you're in another browser session or something. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. What I also think, um, I think he promised that during the Flow Pro show, but he was talking about the cloud clipboard. Um, uh, I, I would love to see that happening anytime soon so mm -hmm. that you can uh, just save it to your, um, yeah, to, to, to Flow and then mm -hmm. uh, reuse it also after you log out. Because yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, of that's course, the, the big thing right now. Uh, and mm -hmm. I would love to see uh, like a copy in the scope, like Brian says in the in the chat. If you can reuse that all the time and use them like really small snippets, uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be uh, a huge win. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you could sort of. Well, yeah, you can sort of do that. Yeah, I guess I sort of do that by <laughs> by just creating a scope mm -hmm. of something that I want to yeah. reuse in a little flow, and then and then copy paste it into another flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but yeah, <laughs> but still super, super handy. Yeah. And what's our number one? The biggest one. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess, I don't know if it makes that much difference really, but it's kind of big news. It was big news. Yeah. It kind of, um, as an Australian, it's Australian language, it's almost an obsession to reduce the number of syllables in words. <laughs> and so when you increase the number of syllables in words, it creates cognitive dissonance for, uh, yeah, for people like myself. So that one is still taking a while to embed into my reptile brain, like Daniel was saying. I still find myself um, saying that. Actually, I've just... Now, this was not a setup, by the way. This just happened to be sitting on the desk. Like, does that mean like the flow t shirts of the past and now retro? Should I be like yes. holding oh, on yes. to these for? Yep. <laughs> right? Definitely. Cool. Definitely. Cool. All I, right. I have, um, yeah, I have to say I was kind of ambivalent about the name change, but until Ignite and then. Um, then when it was used so many times, like in the first day of sessions and like over and over every single session um then i sort of got used to it and i guess I, then i could see you know because they were adding ui flows and things i could see the idea behind it so i i think yeah. i've um, come to grips with it now <laughs> but um <laughs> uh, i mean it's easy as, as long as we can still call things flows which we do and and so yeah, on exactly. and and as long as we're not changing our name then <laughs> i'm fine with it <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think it's one of those things, it, it makes rational, logical sense, um, but you still have got this, you know, embedded three years yeah, yeah. of um, yeah, terminology yeah. and usage. It'll take a little while to sort of yeah. extract itself out of everyone's vernacular. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And we have an extra special bonus news item, and that is... <laughs> Yay, that 2019 was the year we started doing the Flow Pro Show. Yeah. That's, that's important for us. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And, and the logo it, stays. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully it's important for other people too. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, so hopefully everybody enjoyed that. And now we're going to uh, give Paul a chance to talk to us about, yeah, so he gave us this topic, Power Platform Governance for Scared IT Departments. So I'm really interested to hear what you mean by that, Paul. I mean, I think I know what you mean, <laughs> but uh, I think, uh, yeah, I well, guess well, take it away. Aren't, isn't every IT department on the planet scared just by definition? I think so. since, um, I think so. You know, if, if you're tasked with managing infrastructure and if it goes down, it's on you, then by definition, you're going to be scared. So it's kind of understandable. Um, so look, what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the Center of Excellence Toolkit with a bit of a, I, I can't possibly cover all of it in, in uh, um, 
in the time we have, but I'll talk to some of the parts of it and give people a, a bit of a view on the latest, greatest one, plus even a, a, a little bit of a, a snapshot on some of the areas we've taken it because it's designed to be extensible uh, by definition. So we'll do a little bit of that, um, but I also want to kind of uh, frame frame governance because uh, I spend a lot of time uh, in what role? I said to you earlier, it's like, you know, in my Dr. Phil mode where I end up kind of coaching IT departments who are overwhelmed by this pace of change of all of these new new things. And I got to try and sort of um, uh, work with that reflex to close off things long enough for them to get comfortable with some of this stuff. So I'm going to give you a little bit of framing on governance just for a couple of minutes if you indulge me um, and I'll share the screen. I'll the one little bit of PowerPoint. Um, just because if I don't, it will kind of be um, what everything else I say, you'll either go, oh, that makes no sense. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But at least if I if I explain that bit of context, you go, OK, I can kind of see where everything else comes from. So is that OK as a, mm -hmm. as a starting point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. All right. Let's do the whole screen share thing. Where's my mouse? There it is. OK. Now we got to work out which screen to do. I believe it's this one. OK, cool. <laughs> Tell me if you see things. Yep. OK, cool. I'm going to put it into presentation mode. I just my laptop's super unhappy with me right now, too, by the way. I'm running way too many things. All right, let me. Um, oh, it's whinging about video. We'll have to deal with that later. So am I still coming through? You asked you asked. Yes. yes. OK, wonderful. Yes. Yep. OK, so a lot of people ask me and this is like for 10 years. Um, I've been uh, saying this. A lot of people go they want a definition of governance and they'll usually go off to Wikipedia and get some elaborate definition of governance and it sends you down kind of a uh, probably not an ideal path but if you're ever going to pin me down and ask me to define governance I actually never will actually define it because I think it's kind of a zero-sum game but what I will tell you is the origin of the word so the actual context of how the word began yeah it is it's a nautical term and it relates to steering okay and uh, so I believe it's Latin Latin for steer and so the implication of that is you kind of got to have an idea of where you where you're going to because uh, otherwise, you know, it's just kind of random. Now, here, here's a little, I'll oh, see, we'll test my skills of PowerPoint animation here, <laughs> and I'll give you a little hypothetical. Now, some people might have seen this. I've been using this slide literally for 13 years now, okay, because I used to use this in SharePoint, but here's my point. So I've got a little baby here. Now, he doesn't look very happy. Would you agree? A little sad baby. Um, that's because, He's yearning for something. And so he represents the present state of affairs, okay, in an, an organization. There's always a present state. And the present state is always sad, okay, because here's the thing. If it wasn't sad, then you wouldn't spend a whole bunch of time and money and effort on transformation projects and technology projects because, by definition, everything's peachy, okay? So the present state, sad smiley, okay, there's my little symbolism. So there's the opposite view. This is all what we want to become. And if you're into, he, he, you know, some people are a bit scared of this baby. That's why I like him. But so he represents some aspirational future state. Okay. And I'll put him up here and we'll put, you know, here, there, sad, smiley, happy, smiley. We good with that? And so if you ask me to pin down governance, it's really simple. Governance for me is a word that I put in a star that is the means by which I get from there to there. Okay. And so the questions I need to ask to actually do to achieve that is something like, well, OK, what is this there? What does this future state look like? And if you give me an answer like improved collaboration, then I'm going to ask you again, because that actually doesn't mean anything. So you've got to unpack what that looks like and reconcile various different viewpoints, because usually when people say things like, I want a future of citizen developers, they have all these aspirations tied up in that word. But if you actually unpacked it, people have very different interpretations on what that means. Um, that's called chasing platitudes, uh, by the way. So here's another one for you. I want big data analytics. I want AI. I want process automation. Every, every one of those words has that same kind of characteristic that it, it sort of sounds like you know what you're, uh, you're, you're aiming for, but if you don't unpack it, it's probably not the case. Um, then the other question is, well, is that, you know, why? Why is that actually the thing to do? Does that even align to your strategy? Is that what you need to do as an organisation? So is this... this um, this initiative or, or this there, is it actually something that makes sense in the context of where the organization's at? 
Um, if you answer those two questions, or at least get some sort of visibility into that, then you can start to go, okay, so who's going to do what? What are the, what's the kind of key roles to actually make this happen? And then you can start getting down to nitty gritty and 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 saying, okay, and how are we going to do this? What are the tasks? What are the rules? What are the boundaries? So on and so forth. So that's been my conception of governance for a very long time. And if I was to summarize that, I would tell you this. Um, ultimately, governance is a means to an end. It is not the end in itself. And that's the bit where IT departments get tripped up. They actually confuse the means with the end. Because if you say, they'll say to you, we need governance. And I go, OK, to what end? Oh, well, just because we need governance, you see. And so that can lead you down a path of doing a whole bunch of stuff in the name of governance that actually makes things worse. But um, if you look there, really, it's about goal clarity, role clarity, task and rule clarity. They're kind of the, the three things. And just to highlight the, I guess, the visual point of when you confuse the means with the ends, this is the way I find, not just IT departments, by the way, a lot of, I guess, what would you call it, back of house departments like uh, HR, uh, corporate comms, supply chain, you know, um, procurement, those sort of ones that aren't right at the coalface, they tend to kind of take this somewhat um, skewed view of governance. So you can probably see where the issue is there when you start actually chasing governance, because inevitably you get seduced by a very fancy model of all the things that you need to do for governance, and you'll spend a whole lot of time and effort doing those things. And you actually don't know if it actually achieves the end in mind, because you don't know what the end in mind is. So my one little advice to all of you out there, if you want to become a budding management consultant, then here's, here's the one go-to question that I ask constantly. And uh, it's I call it the platitude buster question. So here's, here's the little exercise. You can pick the juiciest platitude management speak you've ever heard. It doesn't matter what you put in that star. And if you say, well, if you had best practice organizational excellence with citizen developer, digital transformation, awesomeness, well, how things be different to now? And because the whole point is you've taken the focus off, you don't say, well, what do you mean by organizational best practice, digital transformation? Because no one actually knows that and you'll end up in a big long argument. But if you actually put that aside and you go, well, look, if you had it, how things be different to now? By definition, people will start saying, well, more of this and less of this. And they start answering questions that are actually have an aspect of measurability uh, about them. And then you start to unpack what this there looks like. And once we do that, then I can tell you how to govern the thing, right? But if if you start, if we start just sort of painting the numbers of doing governance things without having any idea of what that looks like, yeah, it, it, it leads to undesirable outcomes and a whole bunch of work and very heavy process centric things that tend to collapse under its own weight. So that's the that's the sort of ideological part. Now, having said all that, Microsoft, particularly with the Power Platform, it is by definition kind of a bottom-up um, democratizing IT type of platform. And a lot of people who typically did do solutions um, that would normally do developers are now using Power Apps and Flow and the other features in the platform to do some pretty amazing things. And we've, we've seen various case studies. And Brian Dang, he, he's, he's a classic one who who's, uh, springs to mind straight away. Um, so um, given that, um, the idea of just default turning it off, that reflexive, thou shalt turn it off because I don't understand it, therefore I'm scared of it, therefore I should just take it away, is probably not the right thing to do. Um, particularly if you, most organisations have various lofty mission statements around, we will transform the organisation and we'll have an innovation culture and then you just cut it out. You know, it's almost like, well, come on, you know, you're very incongruent with what's sitting on the wall in your value statements. Um, so given that Microsoft have taken a real, like the Power Platform in particular is phenomenal in terms of the amount of visibility you have to what's going on. And if you ask people, in particular IT departments, what is your fear? It's, I don't know what's going on. And so we're going to get lumped with something that I can't manage. I will have to support. I had nothing to do with, and I have to deal with the legacy of it. And it's a completely fair um, position to be. So now let me talk a little bit. Now we're, get, we're going to go tactical now. I'm now going to show you what Microsoft have uh, done about this for those of you that have never seen the Center of Excellence Toolkit. And where is my browser? It, oh, here it is. Cool. So in amongst the various tools and uh, technologies and components within the Power Platform, recently the, uh, the Center of Excellence Starter Kit was created. And it's a project on GitHub, which consists of a whole bunch of Power Apps and flows uh, a couple of custom connectors and a Power BI dashboard designed to give you end-to-end -end visibility as to what's going on in your tenant. 
Uh, in terms of installing it, uh, it comes in as a solution. So we talked about that before, and sorry, I'm going to have to just do the whole refresh thing. Um, here is an example of where you go to GitHub, you get the solution zip file, you import the solution into your tenant, and under center of excellence here, you suddenly have a whole bunch of power apps and flows and all sorts of goodies that have been sort of continually being refined since I suppose July or, or whenever it was uh, released. I think it's about that. Uh, the most recent version is really interesting. So people that have downloaded this a few months ago really should take another look because there's some new stuff that I like quite a lot. But to give you a sense of what's there, let's just talk about the flows first because a lot of the, the magic that underpins this stuff is absolutely flow. So one of the things that it does is there is a series of flows here, these sync template flows, and their job in life is to pretty much enumerate every app, every flow, every app maker, every custom connector, every connection. Um, you can see it all there. It puts all of that stuff into some common data service entities, and it does that on a periodic basis. So it's continually basically crawling everything that's happening on your tenant. Um, then once it goes into CDS, then you can activate that with um, Canvas apps and a model driven app and Power BI. So for example, um, and by the way, here's another thing. I will actually show you one of these flows just for the hell of it, because it's actually a great way to learn flow because they've actually been designed very well. For example, if I go and just open this one here, the admin sync template, um, I'm not going to dive deep because we'd be here all day. So I'll just sort of cherry pick certain topics and, and feel free to ask questions. But if I open this flow, what I like about it is it exposes you to some of the uh, connectors, the admin connectors that you have in the Power Platform to find out what's going on. Um, it also uses really good patterns around try catch patterns. It's got some resilience built in in terms of um, uh, well-designed flows. So takeaways that you can use, you can see there's run after bits and pieces. Those of you that sort of know what these little uh, arrows look like. Um, again, good naming conventions. Just I actually find this quite useful just to actually see what's there, how to use expressions, how to use certain actions. So as far as IT administrators are concerned, when they look at this stuff and it seems sort of overwhelming and over, you know, just, just I guess, yeah, overawing, I suppose. Um, even teaching um, IT folks how to install and manage these flows, it almost kind of pushes their that little geek that started out everybody in the IT industry, that's still there, even the most sort of, um, you know, conservative, pathologically conservative IT to, uh, person ultimately got in for a reason. And um, I found this to be very, very useful in terms of getting people to actually go, this is kind of interesting. I like what this is all about. So um, there's a whole bunch of flows. It basically feeds CDS entities. Um, another flow that I'll mention before we get off flows is have a look at this for this is something new app archive and cleanup. So there is a flow that basically looks at any apps that are in the tenant. And by the default, I think it's six months. If the app is six months old and has not been used in that time, the app maker will be sent an approval uh, request. And if they approve it, it will back up that app, save it into a SharePoint list and delete the app from the tenant. So straight away, IT uh, concern number two, which is, well, stuff will be left there for years and I'll have to clean it up in three years because no one else is going to do it. And, you know, it's just the file share sort of SharePoint story all over again. Well, straight away, you've got the foundation of a way to manage uh, apps that are uh, unused or, um, you know, don't have that much value to the business. That's really uh, interesting. Oh, is, this, is this for... Only Canvas apps for model-driven apps, and what is the last use date? Is that when somebody edited the app, or when somebody no, it's just based on, viewed it's, the app? Or? It's based on, I'll have to look at it again, it's based on usage. I think it's actually based on usage, because another thing we have, so I'll answer that in a slightly roundabout way. Um, one of the other things the, uh, the common data, sorry, common data says, sorry, the uh, uh, COE has, is a custom connector. This is my favorite bit. Here's the other, here's number three that basically reduces anxiety levels for IT departments. There is a open API swagger file, which is a custom connector, which allows you to talk to the Office 365 compliance center. Now, for those of you that are not Office 365 administrators, this is a fairly amazing piece of technology that is on every tenant. It's not enabled by default, but 
I think all new tenants it is, or that's the intention. So you should just go and turn it on. If you've never been in here into the audit log search in Office 365, check this out. I can come in, pick a time, pick a user, and then pick a workload. And I'll just draw attention to how small this scroll bar is here. These are all the various type of events that happen in your tenant. And if I scroll down, because once I pass SharePoint, OneDrive, Exchange, and all that stuff, there's all your Power BI events. Um, you will find some Power Up events, some Teams events, some Flow events. So this is literally a forensic level log of everything that's happening in your tenant. Now, here's the key point. So if I go Power Apps Activities, and then I search on me, you can see that, look, I edit an app at this time. I created an app at this time. That's that forensic level detail. So here's the thing. That custom connector that I mentioned, come back to here, um, one of the flows in the Serenity Excellence Toolkit uses this custom connector to query the Compliance Center and brings back Power App related events and puts that into a CDS entity called the audit log. And so that now means we have very detailed usage performance stats, and we can look at trend data around um, patterns of usage, who used it and all of that sort of stuff. So that in conjunction with that auto cleanup, you can see the power that that gives you because it's not just about when it was last modified, you can literally see when it was last opened and uh, to what extent it was opened. So you can, you can uh, tweak this to uh, quite a significant level of detail. So does that kind of answer your question, Daniel? Yes, it does. Thanks. All right, no worries. Um, now, let me go back to my solution. Um, uh, another flow uh, worth mentioning is the compliance detail request. However, I've actually kind of uh, improved that slightly. We, if we have time, we can talk about that later. I've, I've taken these and used them in various forms. I use these as basic. These are suggestions. You know, It is intended for you not to just put it in and just use it straight up. Although I have clients that have done that and are just really happy because all they wanted was the visibility, the finger on the pulse. But this one here, what it does is any user that goes in, any maker that builds an app, um, if after about a week or so, they haven't filled in details on the intent of that app, um, the audience for that app and its criticality, they will get an email via this flow saying, will you please go to the Compliance Center and fill in the details of this app? The Compliance Center is a Power Apps Canvas app, which I might even have open here somewhere. Uh, I might be lying to you as well. Oh, I've got one of them here. While I'm here, I'll might as well authenticate. Um, but the Compliance Center basically provides you with the ability. It's actually looks very similar to this screen. So as an app maker, it'll be here are all your apps. This app is non-compliant. And you click into the app and you fill in the business justification. You fill in why it's there. You fill in who your boss's name is. Whatever you need, not just technically, but administratively. Who's the owner of this app? Um, who signs the checks on support for this app? All of those sort of, you know, the criticality, that sort of stuff. Um, if I have time, I'll show you an example power if I built that actually extends upon this idea, um, but uh, we'll see how we go. Um, coming back to the center of excellence, though, um, then there's a few others that I'm, oh, this one's cool too. Check this out. Admin, find and disable flows that leverage certain connectors. So instead of DLP policies where you can go, okay, I have a broad-based DLP policy that says thou shalt not use certain combinations of connectors, but you still might want to go that one step further and you go, okay, in this particular environment, if anyone uses this connector um, for certain reasons, I can't just apply a DLP policy because it's a bit too, I guess, baseball bat-like in terms of lack of finesse. Uh, you can use this flow to literally go through and if any of the uh, connectors match a criteria, it will administratively disable that uh, flow. And then you can uh, also modify it to take ownership of it as well and send the user one of those passive aggressive emails that say, thanks for doing that, but you no longer have access. Um, so I won't go through all of the various ones, but that gives you a sense of some of the capabilities uh, there. If we could go to the Canvas apps, there's, a, there's something I wouldn't mind showing you as well before I jump to Power BI. So there is how many? We've, we're up to about eight or nine Canvas apps now in this solution as well. Uh, this is a popular one because I used to do this in PowerShell. There is now a Power App. You know the old story, hit, hit, so here's IT concern number four. Well, what if somebody leaves? Because if that person leaves and they created the app and no one can get on it and it's terrible and bad things happen. So you just go and run the set new app owner app. You find their app, you put an owner in, you click go and it's done. So there's a Canvas app for doing that kind of administrative uh, thing. Um, the Developer Compliance Center is the one that asks users to fill stuff in, but my favorite one is actually this one, the template catalog. So check this out. You can take MS app files. So you know how you might build some template 
Power Apps, you know, one for doing electronic forms or one, you know, a leave form sort of template for, for common business processes. You save that MS app file, you go and put it into a SharePoint library, and then you have this. So I just quickly did this and slightly modified it. So here's a template catalog, and I've taken one of Ashley's apps that she did for the uh, the ad MVP advent uh, thing. And you can come in here and go, oh, I'd like to use this as a basis for one of my apps. And so in this case, normally you download it, but I made it slightly more fancy. And so you can bring up a panel that says, here's the app, here's a video of the intent and the usage of this app, here's a few guidelines, let's download it. I click download. It basically grabs the MS app file, it downloads it, and you can then go into the Power App Studio, load in that MS app file, do a save as, and you now have a template that you can start using your own apps with. You're not building from scratch. So if you combine that with the capability of components and some of the other reusable things, um, that's a really nice uh, nice feature. I do like that one a lot. Um, any questions so far? Happy with that? No yeah. questions. Lots, lots of cool. people commenting how great this looks. Uh, cool. Yeah. Um, so here is actually here's one thing, um, I, and I'm interested in what the uh, what the audience thinks and the time we have. I'm going to show you a little thought experiment I had because the one thing I dislike, and it's or not dislike, the one thing I don't think is the right approach is um, the developer compliance center asks users to rate the criticality of their app. So imagine giving an end user saying, so is your app like super critical or just kind of okay? Um, that just flies in the face of all kind of risk management um, uh, sort of uh, approaches. So consider this one. Here's one I'll just quickly show it and see what you think. This is a little proof of concept. Here's a basic gist when it zooms in. So imagine this is a developer compliance app. So imagine literally just, and by the way, this is a list of questions that I store in SharePoint. So it's like a data-driven app. So you come in, you go, okay, so how many people are using this app of mine? And see across here, I've got some sort of governance considerations and you go, okay, yeah, just my team. And it goes, cool, well, anything your team will have a nominated owner and you're gonna need a cost code and so on and so forth. And then you go, so what system does this need to talk to you? And you go, well, this one here. And you go, well, no, that's not supported. Um, or, you know, when everyone, uh, I get this a lot, someone says, oh, I love Power Apps, I wanna link it to SAP. And then like that, that's kind of a bit of a conversation killer straight up. So, but here's the thing. Now the user wouldn't see this, but if you look down the bottom, I'm actually calculating a score. Okay, so keep an eye on that score at the bottom and the color. Does the app need to store any data otherwise, anywhere other than SharePoint? So there's licensing implications. So you go, yeah, totally. Um, how often will users use this app? All the time. And so again, you start bringing this sort of stuff up. Um, well, now here's the external thing. Are you gonna be sharing this with contractors? Yep. And boom, now we've hit that threshold. Um, does this need to work offline? If you've ever written a Power App and a Canvas app that works offline, you have to build them in a certain way and it requires a certain level of knowledge and it's no longer really citizen dev stuff without some coaching. Uh, here's a flow one, right? And you go, oh, I've totally got a lot of process approvers here, you know, so there's a really complex approval thing. Um, yeah, we're working with photos and, you know, we can only tolerate you know, no more than four hours downtime, boom, now we're into red, okay? And the idea is then, so as the user, they're getting their expectations set. And then you can go generate my personalized plan. And on the next page it goes, cool, here is your governance plan and your app's been rated as complex and here are all the things that will be for you to do. So that's kind of my viewpoint on putting accountability back to the app maker that makes it very clear what's expected of them. And it almost kind of jolts them out of that naive simplicity of, oh, cool, I can totally do this. You know, I sort of ran the wizard and it's great. Now I'm going to link to SAP. So that's the, the kind of my way of going, rather than ask the user to rate directly the criticality of the app, you arrive at a score of what the criticality is based on asking just a series of questions that give you as the administrator a leading indicator view of what's interesting to you. So that's, was wow. some of this came from the center of excellence or that's completely yours? Oh, no, that's my dogma that just I've okay. taken the center of excellence and then going, OK, if you're going to actually do <laughs> well, that. That's what I meant. A, like, it was, like yeah. was there something cool. in the center of excellence that did sort yeah, a little bit of that? It's this developer compliance center, which mm -hmm. I don't have time to load at the moment because I didn't configure it. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. So, uh, okay. but, but the other thing I'll also mention is um, the Power BI, the thing that's killing all my memory on my laptop right now. So as well, you get a Power BI that comes in that is designed in advance to link to all of those CDS entities that I was just mentioning. 
And so you can see here, here is an overview, and this is literally one of our tenants. You can see the environments, you can see the number of apps. You can then go into apps, and you can have a look at the trend data on creation, zoom in, zoom out, filter. Um, there's even drill down. So I can go, cool, let's have a look at this app. What's the usage on this? We'll do a drill through. Let's go to the app detail for this particular uh, app that I've grabbed. And this is what pulls from the audit logs out of the Office 365 Compliance Center that I showed before, that crazy search of everything in 365. And you can see this data you're seeing here is, is uh, that level of audit data. So if you can imagine this app was only made a few days ago but you can actually start to see app growth rates and stuff like that at a, at a glance. I know you can get that in the uh, stats, um, both in the Maker Portal and the Power Platform Admin Center, but this gives you that extra degree of um, uh, granularity. Same thing with flows. You can see all the lovely flows that people have done and all the terrible things and the connectors and, and all of that sort of stuff. So you can see we've been busy in the last uh, couple of months. Um, so basically, again, if you come back to that core proposition of I don't know what's going on in my tenant, what I say to people is I think we can put paid to that. I think you have everything you need. The conversation moves up a notch as to what is important to you. And so that's where I've actually done custom visuals for clients where, for example, a really easy one is I always say to people, choose your battles. You know, I really don't care. If you've built a flow and you've shared it with zero people, I truly don't care about it unless you're using some crazy connector that, you know, might be of interest. Um, and some organize, some of my clients are literally, they put a cutoff at five, you know. Anything over than five, I want to have a look at. And so I did a visual that showed, um, you know, how many power apps and flows that have more than sort of five users. And generally it was maybe 15% of the overall kind of thing. So rather than get overwhelmed with all of these flows, you can pretty much go, you know, most of these are probably personal productivity. And unless they tip a certain threshold of usage um, or sharing rate, I'm probably okay just to not worry too much about it. Let's just choose my battles and worry about the, the big stuff where I am seeing a lot of use or I am seeing a potential um, uh, lead indicators as to, uh, you know, if you're seeing a huge rate of growth on a particular app, you might want to look at that and actually go through some of the developer um, guidelines and see if the app is actually built really well. Same with flows, of course. Use the analytics in the compliance center. Sorry, in the um, uh, Power Platform Admin uh, Center. So, look, that's that's a whirlwind tour, if you like, of some of the uh, the things that you get in the uh, COE toolkit. Um, as I said, uh, you can. My recommendation is it comes as a managed solution and an unmanaged solution. Um, now. All you Dynamics folks will know what that means, but the basic gist is the managed solution. I actually prefer the managed solution because it makes upgrades of new versions easier. So what I tend to do is I'll install a managed solution. Um, I always upgrade to the latest COE, but if I do tailor something and customize something, I'll make a copy of that one little bit. So usually maybe one or two flows I change, but some of those core flows that I was uh, showing you, you know, in uh, up here, um, I tend to leave a lot of these ones, these sync ones that go and slurp all the data for you, I just leave those alone. Microsoft will sort of um, uh, continue to invest in, and improve those. And the evidence on GitHub is this thing does get a lot of love and uh, it is getting a lot of uh, investment. And uh, again, I say to people who haven't downloaded it for a while, that would be a surprise to you. Um, that would be a surprise to you. Um, you know, so there's uh, uh, they're always adding new things to it. So I'm not sure, I haven't been checking the, the Teams chat if there are any uh, uh, questions at this point, but um, uh, yeah, if, if anyone has any questions, happy to, to answer them at this point before we bring it home. There was sure. one question about the roadmap. Uh, is there a roadmap for the COE toolkit so we can see what's coming or contribute on what, what would be useful? So not so much a roadmap, but because it's a community project. So, um, and I wish I had time to contribute to this more. So if I go and find, okay, in GitHub, basically I change all these flows, but I don't have time to package it all up and stick it in Git. But anyway, that's, that sounds very uh, cop out, but it's true. Um, so in GitHub here, basically it is a community contributed thing. You can contribute flows, you can contribute apps, um, for the benefit of the community. You can basically you know, do pull requests, make your changes and all of that sort of stuff. And if you can have a look here, just even looking down here, not so much a roadmap, but an evolution. And it gives you a good indication that it is getting support because you can see here virtually on a monthly basis, you are seeing releases. And you can see mm -hmm. in particular, there's been some innovations in the last 
in the last couple of months. So the archive and cleanup flow, you know, that appeared in the, uh, the the November edition. So one of the reasons why I prefer a managed solution over an unmanaged solution is once you get it in, just just having these things, you know, light up and become available to you yeah. from a simple upgrade, uh, that works very nice. Um, there is a little bit of work, but really, once you've done it a couple of times, it's all of about half an hour to provision this stuff. It really isn't a particularly hard uh, hard exercise, and you get all of that benefit. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so yeah, that's that's the closest you get to a roadmap, basically. So if they want to contribute on what would be useful, I think they could create an issue in the GitHub repo. Uh, you could, yeah, you can basically get an issue, you can clone this repo, you can then do a pull request to then submit it back to uh, back to yeah. them if you had things. Um, yeah, for example, you know, I've got a couple of Swagger files that, that, that talk to the audit log a slightly different way. As you saw, I've got ideas for various Canvas apps and bits and pieces like that. So um, mm -hmm. one of these days I'll get time to actually finish the job and, and submit those back in. Um, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, basically, um, uh, absolutely come in here and just contribute and download it. Um, by the way, even though um, technically, even though it's like CDS, um, it does not require excessive licensing uh, for this stuff. That's, uh, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll say that with a grain of salt because you know I still get confused with the licensing scenarios. So sorry, Microsoft mm -hmm. people on the call. Um, <laughs> but no, I think it was Ryan, Ryan that said to me, it is not their intent to charge you premium licensing for the system administration type thing. So you should be able to perhaps with one uh, premium, you know, user account, like I guess most organizations have that, you deploy this, you scrape all this data, you put it into CDS and you can start collecting that uh, that data. Um, and then I think for compliance um, stuff, I've, I've had some clients, if they're really cost conscious, they can sometimes synchronize what's in CDS to SharePoint and repoint their compliance app to SharePoint. But the most of the workings of this thing, the collection of the data, the Power BI, all of that stuff, that doesn't really, it's not particularly costly. You only sort of need the account to go and collect the data and then interrogate CDS through Power BI, publish that to all workspace, right? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to all the, there's also a lot of administration stuff happening within the power platform of course like the um the blocking of certain connectors i think that's coming this month or next month yep so um, that's what i've described yeah it really is just the start because you're absolutely right mm -hmm. there's there's the admin connectors there's the powershell commandlets there's the yeah. um there's all of the analytics that you can get out of the uh um, admin uh, the various admin centers there's the enhancements around uh dlp um yeah there there really is some um i, I am truly unconstrained you know every question i've been asked the the but what if this happens and what if this happens mm -hmm. you've got some pretty solid answers i mean if you think back to the world of sharepoint on-prem um, and the level of forensic detail we have here and information to be able to make decisions, um, it's it's just a no-brainer, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so, Paul, what's with the what was with the teddy bear? Ah, yes. It so was the on teddy bear. Yeah, it was on the slide. So um, the teddy bear comes from uh, a book I wrote. But here's the basic gist. You know how this is this is the contention of the book. Uh, and it explains a lot of uh, the, uh, I guess, technology industry a little bit. You know how little kids, when they're scared, they use teddy bears, right? You know, go to sleep at someone's house, you've got to have the teddy bear. There, there's actually quite a lot of serious psychology about that. It's called attachment theory. And the idea is little kids, they have to hold on to something that gives them the, I guess, sense of safety to go and sort of venture forth into the world when things are ambiguous. And so the contention in our book was actually nothing changes. Adults still use teddy bears. They're still like kids, right? It's just um, t instead of being real teddies, they tend to be methodologies and processes and management models and you know management fads and all of that sort of uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like kids, though, you know how like some kids eventually, you know, they'll they'll, they'll get to the point and they'll say, "I don't need this anymore, Dad. No, I don't need this anymore, Mom. I don't need." You know, they sort of symbolically let it go because they've made that transition to the next stage. And what what once seemed really scary and ambiguous is just business as usual. Again, same thing happens in organisations. But like like kids, there are some kids that never let go of their teddies. You know, when it becomes a fetish and they it, almost that transition process gets disrupted. And that also happens in organisations where organisations with a blame culture in particular 
these tools, these methodologies tend to get used with this pathological kind of intensity for the express purpose of reducing anxiety, not actually solving a problem. And so you can tell when people use these things in a very me mechanistic kind of unthinking way. So the teddy bear is actually, there is a governance warning there because if you start fetishizing governance, just the way the kid who can't let go of the teddy bear, you're doing it for the sake of reducing anxiety, not actually uh, um, delivering something. So if you've ever been in an organization, you shake your head and you go, I can't believe I'm being forced to follow this ridiculous process, then chances are you're dealing with some, that kind of phenomena happening. So the teddy bear is a little, you know, I, I find that explains a lot of behaviors I see in organizations and particularly attitudes to governance, because it is incredible how seductive a five pillars to governance awesomeness is to organizations that have uh, an aversion to ambiguity. They grab it like it's a teddy bear, they don't let it go, and they literally apply it in such a ritualistic, unthinking way. And then they wonder, then when it doesn't work, they go, gee, that platform was terrible. And they attribute the problem to like, the, oh, SharePoint, awful, you know, and then um, go and do the exact same thing on a new platform because they actually haven't learned. So it's like an anti-learning kind of thing. So. So yeah, watch out for teddy bears and fetishes. I'm sure you've you've probably worked with people that carry a few teddy bears under their uh, arm. Um, one of my business partners, actually, true story, he went to a client who, a guy actually, his teddy bear it was manifested in reality. It wasn't imaginary. He walked around with the project, with PMBOK, the project management body of knowledge, he would walk around with it under his arm. I would, no, no one knew if he had ever read it, but everywhere he went, he had that thing. So that's that's the, uh, that, that's kind of the, uh, uh, the story there. Awesome. Okay. Uh, on that note, I think we're <laughs> Very cool. uh, just, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really, uh, I think really useful information and um, we, everybody, we really appreciate your um, insights onto that, Paul, since I know that's a space that you've been working in for years and years and way before Power Platform. So very cool. Um, so finally, we want to show the results of our community poll. So I'm going to share my screen and see well we've only had 10 people hmm. oh well anyway so we've got what's the order here looks like uh, copy paste came in first and next the licensing changes and then oh mm. oh that's nice <laughs> yay <laughs> <laughs> and uh oh that's ranked nice. us up there with call child flow <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then we've got like AI builder, UI flows, conditional triggers, and the flow online conference. What came in last here? The name change. Well, interesting. And that's, oh, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> Guess that wasn't as impactful as we thought. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so that's interesting. And that poll will still remain open if people want to continue voting on it. Maybe I'll uh, post the results now and then <laughs> or yeah. something. But um, mm -hmm. cool. Uh, I will unshare my screen and um, I think that's it. We'll just wish everybody a happy holiday season and happy new year. Yeah. So yeah, happy holidays, you guys. See you next uh, time. <laughs> yep, yep, sometime in January. Thanks, right. Paul. <laughs> yeah, thank no you worries. so much, Paul. Okay. You're welcome. Bye. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.